How many of you here think history is boring? <laughs> <laughs> Too many. The ones that are still in school. <laughs> well, I felt the same way when I was your age. And then, somehow, I became a history professor. The thing is, I came to realize that we're a product of what has happened to us in the past. We're shaped by what we and our ancestors have lived through. Now, my specialty is the Civil War. I'm trying to find the truth behind a story that began 150 years ago. Now, how can something that old still be important? Well, I think I can show you. Here's the background of the story. In the second year of the Civil War, with things going badly for the Union armies, the President made a rather famous proclamation. Now, therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, by virtue of the power vested in me as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do proclaim that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state which shall then be in rebellion against the United States shall be then, thenceforward and forever, free. decision to free the slaves was just a military maneuver to give the Confederates trouble at home. But Lincoln said, If my name ever goes into history, it will be for this act, and my whole soul is in it. However, there was a legal problem with the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> Border states such as Maryland and Tennessee had already been occupied by Union soldiers, so legally, the slaves in those states were not yet free. Still, when Grant's Army of the West marched through Tennessee, his soldiers told the slaves they had already been free. So they just grabbed whatever possessions they could and fled their masters to follow that army. Come back here, Jordan! Confounded, ungrateful nigger! Come back here! I swear to God I will shoot you down the road if you don't get back here! Damn it, Carter! What in the hell are you interfering for? Those are my niggers! Jordan, get your black ass back here! Don't you believe them damn Yankees? You ain't emancipated, you are my property! Where the hell do you think you're going? How am I supposed to run the place all by myself? All the field hands took off and now? Damn you! Gone. And took his whole family with him. Jumping Jehoshaphat. Do you mind if I tape record this conversation? No, not at all. March 14th, 2009. I'm sitting in the home of Mr. Jewel Wilson of Dayton, Ohio. And Mr. Wilson is a direct descendant of Jordan Anderson. He was my great granddaddy. Now, you say Jordan? That's how he pronounced it. Sometimes it was spelled J O R D O N, and sometimes J O U R D A N. But no matter how they spelled it, his family called him Jordan. And how do you know that? That's what my grandmother told me. Ah, and she was? His daughter, Jane. Uh, died at the age of 90 years old in 1942. I was 14. And she told you all the family stories? She wanted to pass them along. Can you tell me some? 
Her earliest memory was playing on the dirt floor in a one-room cabin. Her mother gave her a dried up ear of corn with the, the husk all peeled back, told her it was a doll baby. <laughs> she was dancing it all around like the husk was a skirt, so proud to have a toy of her own. <laughs> Here's another one of, of, of her stories before they ran off. So she would have been about 10 years old. This was back on Colonel Patrick Anderson's plantation, Big Spring, Tennessee. Hmm. Colonel had a daughter named Mary. She was about the same age as Grandma Jane. They used to play together. This white girl got it in her head to teach this little darky to read. I dossed Miss Mary. You just do what I tell you or you'll get a whooping. Yes, sir. But I ain't. Hush up now. I'm a teacher. You say it after me. A is for axe. A for a axe. B is for box. B for a box. C is for cat. Mary! <gasps> what in the land of Goshen do you think you are doing? A, a B, C's daddy. Why is that little darky saying I'm over? Teaching her daddy. Don't you know any better than that? It's against the law to teach doctors to read? Yes, Daddy. Bend over that chair. Both of you! Same punishment for teaching <laughs> as for learning. <laughs> The next thing she remembered was leaving the plantation. But when did they leave? It would have been the summer of 1863. Grant soldiers told them they were free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Colonel Anderson tried to shoot them when they left. <laughs> Grandma Jane said if it hadn't have been for a neighbor, she said that shot right over their heads. Where did they go? To Nashville. They followed the army so they'd be safe. And she said her, her daddy wound up tending to the Yankee soldiers there at the Cumberland Field Hospital. And her mama worked as a laundress. And here's a strange coincidence. Their old master, not the colonel, his father, the general, he had joined the Confederate Army. But he was too old to, to serve as a, a field officer, so they put him in charge of procurement, getting supplies for the ribs but he got captured by Grant's soldiers and he was in prison right near the hospital. <laughs> Granddaddy used to love to tell the family how he would pass by the prison on his way to work and see the general looking at him behind the bars. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you walk away from me, Jordan Anderson. Yes, sir. You get right back up to Big Spring where you belong. I can't do that, Miss Patsy. Can't? The idea running off. I'm sorry, ma'am. The doctor told me I got to take care of these his soldier boys. Never mind that. You got a plantation to run. My son is going crazy trying to find help with the plant. And the general, oh Lord, the general, he saw you walking by the prison this morning, free as a bird. And he's sitting in there behind bars. He like to burst his brains out. And he's the man who picked you up when you was born and give you your name, the injustice of it all. You get your hands off me. I'm talking to my slave. You better do what I say, Jordan. Uh, that's enough. <coughs> uh, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. I know, sir. You can say that to officers. <laughs> Every time in my life I forgot to say it, I got whooped. My head is buzzing like a beehive. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. I, I mean, what should I call you? Uh, name's Bob. Everybody calls me Bob. Yeah. I couldn't do that. <clears throat> who was that old lady with you, the one who was after you? Uh, Ms. Anderson, the general's wife. Yeah, what was she calling you? Jordan. That's a strange name. I never heard a name like that before. Where you get a name like that? 
The general gives it to me when I was born. Hmm. Jordan what? Anderson. He adopt you? <laughs> Wait, what are you laughing at? Every slave on the place was named Anderson. So people know who he's belonged to. Now that's it. Now that's just plain weird. <laughs> that's just how it was. You gonna keep that name now that you're free? Only his name I got. Private Killigrew, how you doing? Ah, don't talk. Let's have a look at that head. Ah, that musket ball just grazed you. You're gonna have a little crease over your ear, that's all. Oh, don't fuss. This ointment will keep you from getting an infection. Yeah, you can grow your hair long and hold it on that side and no one will even notice it. Now, raise your head, sir. There you go. You think you can hear in that ear? Yeah, it might come back yet. Um, have you swallowed anything solid for a change? Jordan, let's give this man some bread sopped in milk or the like. And Jordan, I've got some good news for you. The provost marshal has sent your freedom papers over. You are going to Ohio, you and Mandy, next month after you get your pay, of course. My father-in-law is a banker in Dayton, Ohio, and he's going to be setting you up. Good day, gentlemen. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> My grandmama would tell me when we got to that big river, I didn't stop. I just walked right on in, waded in up to my knees, splashing water all around, laughing out loud and singing. Gonna get a ride across the Ohio. Giant. The boat is fixing to leave. Where did the ferry take them? Took them to Cincinnati, biggest city they ever seen. Grandma Jane got lost, took them a while to find her, then to find the train station, and a while to figure out how to get to Dayton. But they got here. Why Dayton? Well, Dr. McDermott, the chief surgeon at the, the, Cumberland, the Cumberland Field Hospital there in Nashville, he sent them up here to his father-in-law. And his father-in-law was Dayton's most famous abolitionist, Valentine, Valentine Winters. Richards. He passed slaves through Dayton on the uh, Underground Railroad in the years before the war. And once he had the Emancipation Proclamation to back him up, he came right out in the open, defied the copperheads. He started finding homes and jobs for people of color right here in Dayton. Welcome to Dayton, Mr. Anderson. Please, sit down. Oh dear, what did I say? Are you I'm all very, right? I'm very sorry, sir. Nobody ever called me Mr. Anderson. And no white man ever said please to me or invited me to sit down. Well, it's uh, time you started getting used to it. You're not a slave anymore, you're citizen of the United States of America. <laughs> May I call you Jordan? Jordan? Wow. You say it like that river in the Bible. <laughs> it's a fine name. <laughs> As it happens, I have a uh, own a small house that I normally rent out, but it's empty now. Your family can use it until you can afford one of your own. No, thank you, sir. It's, uh, it's only four rooms. Four? Mr. Winters, we ain't never had more than one. How will I ever be able to? Well, we'll just have to find you a job so that you can start earning some money. I don't know how you'll feel about this, and, uh, and I don't want to insult you, but I'm in need of a coachman at the moment if you're not averse to that kind of work. I've done that kind of work most of my life without getting paid a penny. I surely do thank you, sir. It's just temporary, <laughs> you understand. 
until you can find suitable employment of your own. My son-in-law tells me that your wife worked as a laundress at the hospital. If she wants to continue in that line of work, I'm sure we can find her plenty of customers. <laughs> She'll be mighty thankful, sir. Now, you have two daughters. Uh, yes, sir. The Millie is 15 and can help a mother. But Jane, Jane's just a little thing, Mr. Winters. Can't she wait a year to start working? Well, I wasn't thinking about a job. I was thinking about school. School? My little girl's gonna learn how to read and write. I apologize, Mr. Winters, for acting foolish. I'm a grown man. And I don't eat, even when I'm being whooped. But I just never come across this kind of... I feel like I died and caught in the heaven. I promise you, Jordan, Dayton is not heaven. For colored people, it's only a little better than Tennessee. There are a lot of copperheads in this town who think that the only thing worse than freeing the slaves was encouraging them to come up here. Don't get your hopes up too high. You heard about the draft riots in New York? Ain't that about men who don't want to join the army? Well, that's how it started. But it's turned into a race riot. They started out burning the provost marshal's office, but now they burned down a Negro orphanage and lynched a colored man. Why? These are poor working men, immigrants mainly. Who They've been told that freed slaves will compete with them for scarce jobs. And they're angry about being drafted into a war that they think is about freeing the slaves. Ain't that what it's about, Mr. Winters? No. The war was started by the Confederate states. It had many causes. A lot of Northerners aren't abolitionists, and they didn't think it would last this long or come to freeing the slaves. Mr. Lincoln made the Emancipation Proclamation in order to stir discord behind the Confederate lines. And it's working. Last year we were losing the war. And this year we've started to win. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how my grandmama became acquainted with Montgomery's reader for the second time without getting a whooping. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Mama, here is John. They are Anne and Jane. Are you in that book? No, Mama. It's a picture of a little white girl. She got the same name as me. Anne has a new book. It is her first book. Anne must keep it nice and clean. Is that Miss Ains' book? No, Mama. It's just the words in the lesson. This book is mine. Miss Clevender gave it to me and taught me how to say the words in the book. And you are reading it? Yes, Mama. Lord have mercy. Say it again. Here is John. They are Anne and Jane. Anne has a new book. So, neither Jordan nor Amanda knew how to read? No, slaves were not allowed to learn. Mm -mm, slaves were not allowed to learn at all. However, Jordan was a, a very intelligent man. Practically speaking, he helped run the plantation for the colonel. He could figure on his fingers. He knew all about planting and, and reaping, carpentry, horse coping, he told the field hands what to do. There was more than 30 of them, and he was always real proud that he never had anyone beaten. Of course, the colonel or his sons or the overseer would beat them. Sometimes they beat him too. Well, did Jordan learn to read after he got to Dayton? No, I guess he figured he was too old to learn. But he was surely proud that his little girls could read and write. And later, his little boy, Grundy. There's an odd name. 
Well, Grundy was named for a Tennessee senator who opposed slavery, and he tried to stop the state from, from joining the Confederacy. <laughs> Grandma Jane said her father and Mr. Winters would discuss the course of the war and the things that were happening in the papers. Then he would come back and tell them all he had learned and what he thought about it. She said the other colored people in the church they went to thought of him as a natural leader. Sometimes they would call him chief. Chief? Why? He had some Cherokee blood. When they come to the North with practically nothing but the clothes on their backs, he carried with him a Cherokee peace pipe. It was the only thing his mother had given him, and he treasured it. I remember it very well. My older brother, my older brother used to keep it at his house. Do you still have it? How I wish I did. Now, after my older brother died, we couldn't find it. All right. It was, it was our one, one piece of history. Well, that and Grandma's McGuffey reader. <laughs> right. Oh, and one more thing, a newspaper copy of the letter that Jordan wrote to the newspapers. That's why you're here, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. That letter's been causing quite a stir on the internet lately. There's a lot of speculation about whether it's authentic, whether Jordan could have written it, uh, whether it's historically accurate. Uh, I'm trying to find out the history behind it. I visited Wilson County, Tennessee last August. Well, did you speak to any of Colonel Anderson's descendants? I couldn't find any. Uh, it seems that after the plantation was lost, the whole family moved to Arkansas. At least I couldn't find any record of them in the, in the census of 1870 for Wilson County. As a matter of fact, Big Spring, Tennessee doesn't exist anymore. The nearest town is Lebanon. So I was going through the county records there. How do you do? Well, how do you do? I hope you don't think badly of me for pushing myself on a complete stranger, but I have my reasons. <laughs> Not at all. I'm Asa Crowder, and this is my wife, Marie. Well, I'm just a visitor from Detroit. How do you do? A history professor, actually. A professor? Oh, my. Well, the librarian told us you were looking through the Civil War records for the county. Yes, I have a special interest in the Civil War. So do I. I'm sure that's why she mentioned it. I think I'm the only other person in town who grubs around those dusty old shells. Maybe shelves. we'll show you around town, Professor. Well, I'd love to. Marie wants to make sure you don't miss seeing the statue of her great great don't granddaddy. Don't embarrass me now. A general happy? Oh, you see, darling, the man knows his stuff. As a matter of fact, if you're curious about Wilson County's role in the Civil War, I have a special treat for you. Oh, hey, sir. <laughs> this evening is a monthly meeting of the Sons of the Confederacy. As an officer, it would give me a great pleasure if I could invite you to come as my guest. Oh, well, actually, I have to drive back. To... I'd love to. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> what exactly are you researching? The history behind the Jordan Anderson letter. Oh, well, um, if uh, I may say one thing, and I hope you're not offended, but it might be just as well if you don't mention any of this, uh, your research into my fellow members. Listen, if my presence there would be awkward. Not at all. Not at all. No, no, we would be deeply offended if you refused our invitation. It's just that the Anderson letter has caused quite a stir around here with all the attention on the internet. Oh, some have even questioned its authenticity. As well they should. Despite its long historical tradition, the letter is a hoax. A hoax? I'm afraid so. You may not know this, but Jordan Anderson was illiterate, so he couldn't have possibly have written that letter. It was, in fact, composed by a famous abolitionist, Valentine Winter, who released it to the newspapers in a massive campaign to turn the Southern Negro against their former masters. Well, of course, he didn't actually write the letter because he never learned how to write, but he dictated it to Mr. Winters. Was it really an answer to a letter from his former master? Oh, yes. You see, Colonel Anderson had become desperate by the end of the war. You can't run a plantation without field hands. The slaves had all run off, and so many young men had died in the war, there weren't enough to handle the jobs that had to be done. 
And since nobody in their right mind wants to be a field hand, Colonel Anderson and his son Henry were trying to farm the place by themselves. Quite a change from sitting on the porch. Well, apparently they were already on the verge of bankruptcy. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess he thought his old servant was the only one who could get colored field hands to come back and work the plantation. Now, do you still have the colonel's letter? How I wish I did. Wouldn't that be a piece of history? All right. So now we come forward to uh, 1865, and the war is over. And in the second week of August, my great-grandfather got a letter from his old master. Yes, Mr. Winters? Jordan? I have just received the strangest piece of correspondence that I have ever come across. Well, actually, I haven't received it at all. It's, uh, it's addressed to you. Me? From your former master at Big Spring. Colonel Anderson wrote a letter to me. Unless this is some kind of hoax. And from the contents, I almost think it must be. Sit down, Jordan. Tell me, were you too close? Were you friends? Well, the old general gave me to my master when I was six years old and he was eight. We were together more than 30 years. I was his personal servant growing up. I used to get his clothes for him and his meals, saddled his horse, drove his carriage, cleaned up after him. And when we were boys, we used to box and wrestle. Of course, I never beat him, even if I could. <laughs> we used to race on foot and on horseback. And when he took over the plantation from his father, he made me his head stableman, and later I was his driver. He trusted me. He was real mad when I left him, and I don't blame him for that. But Mr. Winters, I don't think you could call us friends. But perhaps he thought you were, or, or uh, thinks you owe him some kind of loyalty, or? Yeah. Anyway, he says here he wants you back. Back? He wants me to go back to Tennessee? He says he wants you to help him run the plantation. He says he promises to do better for you than anybody else can. Promises to give you your freedom, pay you a good wage. He says he knows you are longing to see them all again. I suppose he means his family. Do you think he could possibly believe that? I guess he could. <laughs> I do miss some of them, though not his boys. Perhaps he's just trying to get you in range of his pistol again. Hard to say. You just never know what's going on in the mind of a white man. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Winters. <laughs> no need to apologize. You're probably right. <laughs> Jordan, I think you should answer this letter. Why? I think Colonel Anderson needs to know just what you think of his offer. You mean tell him what I really think? I would hate to upset him. Why? <laughs> <laughs> you just tell me what you want to say and I will commit it to paper. All right. To my old master, Colonel P.H. Anderson, Big Springs, Tennessee. Henry! Come here! Listen to this! <laughs> what is it? What is it, Daddy? Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find that you had not forgotten Jordan and that you wanted me to come back and live with you again, promising to do better for me than anybody else can. I have often felt uneasy about you. I thought the Yankees would have hung you long before this for harboring the Rebs they found at your house. I suppose they never found out about your going to Colonel Martin's to kill the Union soldier that was left by his company in their stable. How did he know about that? Although you shot at me twice before I left you, I did not want to hear of your being hurt and am glad you are still living. Hmm. It would do me good to go back to the dear old home again and see Miss Mary and Miss Marla, give my love to them all, and tell them I hope we will meet in the better world 
if not in this. Sounds like he don't intend to come, and I notice he don't include me. I would have gone back to see you all again when I was working in the Nashville hospital, but one of the neighbors told me that Henry intended to shoot me if he ever got the chance. He got that right. I suppose that'll do for greetings. Now, what is this offer he's making me? He doesn't say. Better ask him. I particularly want to know what the good chance is you propose to give me. We are doing tolerably well here. I make $25 a month with clothes and biddles. I have a comfortable home for Mandy. Folks call her Mrs. Anderson. And the children, Millie, Jane, and Grundy, go to school and are learning well. The teacher says that Grundy has a head for a preacher. They go to Sunday school. And me and Mandy attend church regularly. And we are kindly treated. Sometimes we overhear others saying them colored people were slaves in Tennessee. The children feel hurt when they hear such remarks. But I tell them it was no disgrace in Tennessee to belong to Colonel Anderson. Many doctors would have been proud, as I used to be, to call you master. Now, if you will write and say what wages you will give me, I will be better able to decide whether it would be to my advantage to move back again. Now we get to it. As to my freedom, which you say I can have, there is nothing to be gained on that score. As I got my free papers in 1864 from the Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville, Mandy says she would be afraid to go back without some proof that you are kindly disposed to treat us justly and kindly. And we have, and we have concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. Now there's some cheek. This will make us forget and forgive old scores and rely on your justice and friendship in the future. I served you faithfully for 32 years and Mandy for 20 years. At $25 a month for me and $2 a week for Mandy, our earnings would be $11,680. Glory be! Add to that the interest for the years those wages were kept back. But you know, he did feed us, doctor us, and kept a roof over us. He did as much for his cattle. They probably felt grateful too, up until the time they were slaughtered. Now, Mr. Winters, I just got a different way of looking at it than you. Uh, the Lord wants us to be thankful and count our blessings. All right, Jordan. It's your letter. Let's see, interest or run. Earnings amount to $11,680. Add to this the interest for the time that our wages have been held back and deduct. The cost of clothing, the three doctor's visits for me, and the pulling of a tooth for Mandy. The balance will show, in justice, what we are entitled to. Good. Supposing he decides to stand still for this, how do you want the money? Please send the money by Adams Express, in care of V. Winners Esquire, Dayton, Ohio. You realize you have about as much chance of receiving that money as you have of finding the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> well, then write this. If you fail to pay us for our faithful labors of the past, then we will have little faith in your promises in the future. Jordan, you should have been a lawyer. Now, tell them just how you think and feel. We trust that the Maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs that you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers in making us toil 
for generations for you without recompense. Here, I draw my wages every Saturday night. But in Tennessee, there is never any payday for Negroes. As much as there is for horses or cows, surely there will be a day of reckoning for those who defraud the labor of his hire. I take it back. You should be a preacher. Do you think that'll do? Jordan, I'll tell you what. I'm going to have this letter published. I'm sending this to the editor of the Cincinnati Commercial. Let me just ask you to add one more thing. You remember telling me how Henry forced himself on those poor slave girls and then they, they were sent off to Arkansas when they got pregnant. Could you manage to just mention that and, uh, and how the colored people were prevented from learning to read and write? There's still a lot of people in this country who just don't know about those things. I don't want to go and get the colonel in into trouble. You sure? All right. How about this? In answering the letter, please state that there is any safety for Millie and Jane as they are grown now and both good-looking girls. You know how it was with poor Matilda and Catherine. What happened to those girls, Daddy? Go on in the house. Get. I would rather stay here and starve and die if it comes to that than have my girls brought to shame by the violence and wickedness of their young masters. You will also please state if there has been any schools open for the colored children in our neighborhood. The great desire of my life now is to give my children an education and have them form virtuous habits. Say howdy to George Carter and thank him for taking the pistol from you when you were shooting at me. From your old servant, Jordan Anderson. Well, that's it for me, George. He has done me in. I took care of that boy like a brother for 32 years. Fed and clothed him, let him get married, have children, run the damn place. And all it did was to make him uppity. He is laughing at me. He is having fun at my expense. And now how am I gonna find hands without him? No crop, no money. I'm looking at bankruptcy. You wanna buy Big Spring cheap? Um, I know a lawyer who would uh, give you $5 for it. Done. <sighs> you do make a convincing case that Jordan actually wrote that letter. Well, that's what my grandmother told me. And she was a God-fearing church lady and a truth-telling teacher all her life. Well, now, what became of the other children, Millie and Grundy? Well, Millie married and had a big family. Grundy joined the Buffalo Soldiers, and he rose to the rank of captain in the 25th United States Negro Infantry Regiment. His unit charged up San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt. Wow. In 1870, Mandy and Jordan had their last son, Valentine Winters Anderson. <laughs> he became the publisher of the first black newspaper in Dayton. He went to a medical school in Louisville. Then he moved to Detroit, and he got his MD degree at the Michigan College of medicine and surgery. Oh, that was the beginnings and, of Wayne State University. That's it. And then yeah. after that, he moved back here to Dayton and he, he practiced medicine here for many years. An American success story. <laughs> well, I can't say the same for Colonel Anderson. During my research in Tennessee, I found out that he sold the uh, farm for $5 to avoid bankruptcy. And even still, he was plagued by debts and court cases. Finally, in September of 1867, he made out his will, expressed his 
profound embarrassment, and then two days later he was dead. There was a suspicion of suicide. Well, in the meantime, the rest of his family moved to Arkansas, and his creditors still pursued them there with court cases for another quarter of a century. <laughs> in the meantime, Jordan's letter was published in every newspaper of consequence all throughout the North. The, the New York Daily Tribune picked up the article from the, the Cincinnati commercial. That's when the name started to get misspelled. But no matter how they spelled Jordan, that story turned up everywhere from Chicago to San Francisco. It was reprinted in Lydia Child's Freedman's book, a prima that was used in the Freedman schools in the South. So at least the black folks in the South got a chance to read it. <laughs> well, then what happened to Jordan and Amanda? In 1867, Dayton decided to build a soldier's home for the, the Union veterans. Jordan was hired to plot the land. Then, in 1870, Congress passed the 15th Amendment. Oh, which guaranteed every citizen the right to vote regardless of race, creed, or previous condition of servitude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's exactly right. Then, in 1888, I believe it was, 18, what was it? 1888. 1888. Mr. Winters, he made it possible for them to buy their own home. And then in 1890, he died. Valentine died. His will made provisions for a pension for life for my dear friend, Jordan. So, Despite all the, the pain and the prejudice that they suffered, they found a good home right here in Dayton. And so did his descendants. Well, I guess we shouldn't be too hard on our friends in Tennessee. Although it's taken a while, things are changing there too. I have to tell you a story from the last night I was there. <laughs> you talking about that meeting with the sons of the Confederacy? Uh, no, just before that. That was a wonderful dinner. Thank both of you so much. Oh. I had heard about Southern hospitality, but uh, oh, I have to say this whole day all, is... Professor. Now, I'm going to have to say bye-bye. Asa, I'm going to leave you and the professor to your old meeting. Where are you off to, sweetie? Democratic Party headquarters. I am so <laughs> thrilled. Linda called, and she said that Senator Obama has been nominated for president, and I am not about to miss his acceptance speech. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, they are, Professor. Times, they are a-changing. <laughs> and that's why I find history so fascinating. <laughs>